God's good, right? And even if, even if nobody expected uh, anything to happen today and you were expecting to come in and have Pastor Craig up here, hey, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, but God was not caught off guard by what, what was gonna happen today and he has something for you. So don't tune out. He has something for you today. Um, and uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Like I said earlier, um, we're gonna jump into a new series over the next four weeks or so. Uh, where we're talking about breaking free. And um, really, honestly, God has freedom for all of us to experience in life. Anybody, anybody agree with that? Okay, come on, second service. I know that you are all pumped up during worship, all right? Uh, but I, I know that we can get excited about the freedom that God has for us, right? And so when, when we walk through circumstances, when we walk through situations uh, that maybe we find ourselves stuck in, don't get discouraged because God has freedom for you. Um, listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, for, the, for where the spirit of the Lord is, uh, there is freedom, right? For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I wrote this, I wrote this down in my notes real quick. Uh, I wrote this down in my notes. Uh, the Lord's here, like we, when we come together as a church, we say this, it's right out of the word, where, uh, where two or three or more are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst, right? That's like the middle of all this. So like we're gathered in the Lord's name, right? Like there's, at least I know there's two or three of us that are here in the Lord's name, right? Uh, and so the Bible says that the Lord is in the midst, like his presence is in the midst, which that means just in the middle of all that's going on. Right, so of course there is a spirit of freedom that is here for us to encounter today, right? But also, it's, this is how good God is. It's not just because we're here that we can experience freedom. When we give our lives to the Lord, right? The Lord's presence lives inside of us, right? His spirit lives inside of us. And so I don't care if you're going to your house. Hey, his presence is there, so you know what that means? Freedom is there with you. I don't care if you're going to work, your workplace. You might, you might hate going to your place of work, right? You may think that that is the most bound up place that you've ever been to. Like there's just a whole bunch of bumps on the log, you know, like just, it's, it's depressing. Nobody likes each other there. But you know what? When you go there because of what lives inside of you, who lives inside of you, a spirit of freedom goes there with you. Right? It's not, it could be to the doctor, it could be to the grocery store, it could be to wherever you're going, wherever you step foot, as long as you've given your life to the Lord's and his spirit lives inside of you, that is where freedom is, right? And so today, we're going we're gonna to dive in a little, deep, a little deeper into this one area that maybe so many of us, probably so many of us, especially in a room like this, deal with, and we're going to talk about how to find freedom from insecurity, Freedom from insecurity, right? How many of you are like, I deal with insecurity, all right? Like probably there's more of you, but you might be insecure about saying that, right? <laughs> uh, have, you ever been, have you ever been to a job interview? And uh, I'm pretty sure when I interviewed for this job, I did this, um, where they ask you what your weaknesses are. Yeah, okay, Nobody, nobody's ever been asked that question. Oh, that's good. Um, no. They ask you where, what your weaknesses are, and um, how many of you are like, man, I can, I can do that all day. Like, I can talk about my weaknesses. And they ask you what your strengths are, and you're like, uh. <laughs> uh for those of you who know yourself well, maybe that's not an issue. Uh, but I know that when, when I was asked in interviewing for this job, hey, what's one, of your, what's one of your weaknesses? That was the thing that I said. I, was, I am kind of insecure. I doubt myself a lot. And so I know that I deal with this issue. Uh, and so having sat through, having sat through hearing, um, you know, Pastor Craig talk about it first service, uh, I know that I got a lot from it and I'm gonna try my best, uh, but just remember I'm a little insecure, okay? Uh, so, but, but it's, it's gonna be good. And because God wants you, just like he wants you to experience freedom from addiction, he wants you to experience freedom from depression, from any other kind of mental uh, or emotional setback. He wants you to experience freedom from this thing that holds you back called insecurity. And so we're going to talk about insecurity through the life of Moses, right? How many of you, how many of you know who I'm talking about? Brother Mo, right? Moses, he was an 
he was insecure and he knew it, right? Moses, let me just give you some context before we, before we get in any further. Moses, just a brief summary. If you don't know already, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit. Moses was born in Egypt as a Hebrew. He was born, uh, he was born to the slaves. Uh, the Hebrew people were enslaved by the Egyptians. And uh, he was born after a decree had been made by Pharaoh, hey, get rid of it. Like, there's way too many of these Hebrew people. Uh, we need to exterminate, make sure they don't, they don't grow in population because we can't handle that. Uh, that's what the Egyptians thought was. And so they, they made this decree. Pharaoh made this decree. It was like, hey, we're going to get rid of all of the baby boy Hebrews, right? We're going to get rid of all of the Hebrew baby boys. And so Moses was born after that decree happened. And so in order to save his life, long story short, his mom uh, and his sister put him into the Nile River, let him go downstream or down river. Uh, and, and lo and behold, the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, finds Moses in this basket. Didn't know, but, but she was trying to have a bit. Like she wanted children. And so she took Moses and made, uh, made him her own right? Um, you can look at all the different little intricacies, but for our purposes today, like she, he was raised, Moses was then raised as a prince of Egypt. Shout out to Prince of Egypt back in the day. Come on. Yeah, we know that that was the best Christian movie ever made. Um, no? Okay. All right. Uh, listen, deliver us. Okay. Um, and so, so Moses was raised as an Egyptian prince, and he was raised in the court and all of the privileges that royalty would have got, he got them. Um, and then one day he just, you know, I, I don't know what's going on in his mind, but one day, you know, you got to kind of figure like, yeah, I don't, I don't really look like these people. Right. Uh, and so like, what's the story here? And so Moses began to wonder, uh, and, and by wonder, I mean like wonder and then wander. Uh, and he was going around and looking at all of the different things that were going on. Uh, and he, he saw this happen. He saw, uh, uh, an Egyptian slave master murder a Hebrew worker. Right. And, um, he, he hated it. And he took, he took action and he killed that Egyptian. And then he's like, oh no, what am I going to do? And he hightails it out of Egypt, runs into the wilderness uh, and, and finds a group of people, becomes, um, becomes kind of one of them, becomes a shepherd, right? And um, how many of you, you're like, you're tracking with me right now. Uh, he becomes a shepherd and God does incredible things. He gets married um, and God does incredible things in the wilderness where Moses finds himself in and in this moment, in this season of his life, uh, there was some pretty awesome things that happened in order for Moses to break free from this level of insecurity. Um, so one of the first things, when it, when it comes to breaking free from insecurity, how to find freedom from insecurity, one of the first things that we've got to do is we need to admit that we need God. One of the first things that, honestly, that's one of the first things that we need to do to find freedom from anything is to admit that we need God, right? And so let's look at, let's look at Exodus chapter two, verse 23 real quick. We see that while Moses is out in the wilderness, while he's out and he's shepherding uh, sheep, right? He's shepherding flocks uh, of sheep. There's something else going on in Egypt and uh, we, we dive right back into what's going on in Egypt in uh, chapter two, verse 24. Uh, it says, God heard there, this is the Hebrew people, God heard their groanings and he remembered his covenant. He, he, heard, he heard their groanings and he remembered, uh, he remembered, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. Um, God heard their groanings and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Remember that when you call out to God, he hears you. When you find yourself wrapped up, bound up in things that maybe like, you know, you just deal with, you're tired of dealing with, you know, you wake up in the morning and you know, it's going to be a struggle to get through, through your day as it relates to insecurity. Maybe those of us in the room that deal with insecurities, like we wake up every day and we just anticipate 
that we're going to have to deal with this unhealthy thing, and it's going to keep us from experiencing all that God has for us during the day. And some of us, we might not even be able to put words to that yet, but that's the feeling that you get. I'm not going to be able to experience the things that maybe other people would, or maybe that I know that I should, because I'm dealing with this thing called insecurity. And what I want you to remember today is this. Your step one is this. Just admit that you need God. Just admit that you can't get over it until you call God into it, right? You can't move forward until you let God come and help you get there. And so the first thing that you need to do is you need to admit that you need God. Um, The Hebrew people did this. And sometimes I also think this, that God is just waiting for us to ask him to help us, right? How many... I'm going, we're going through this season right now in our house. We have a three and a half year old uh, and no hate, okay, no shame. We're dealing with potty training, all right? I know he's three and a half, but a boy after two older girls is something wildly different, all right? Uh, and so, so we're dealing with potty training right now. You remember that season in your life? Like, just give me an amen. Yeah, I got you, all right? Um, so potty training right now, and uh, we're, we're getting there. We're making progress. I think we're close to the end. Um, one of the things that we really had to just take a step and do, though, is uh, we, we just had to move from pull-ups to underwear. Like, you, you definitely didn't think you're going to hear me talking about underwear this morning. Uh, I know you didn't. Uh, I know you didn't come in here thinking, somebody's going to be talking about underwear. I guess, no, that's not, that's not it. Um, but we just had to take that step, right? Like, homeboy's never gonna get it if we don't let him have the chance. So, so we, we, we took that step. We put him in underwear, big boy underwear. He's excited about it. You know, we got like Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, <laughs> PJ Mask, you know, all of the things. Um, and, and, and so, but, you know, what we found was we were struggling with uh, him identifying, or not even identifying, but him understanding, uh, like, you need to go to the bathroom. Like, we help him along, but then on his own, he's, he's not asking for help. And I remember this. It was like the first time. You, know, you remember that first dirty pair of underwear as your potty training parents? Like, you understand. Uh, if you're not a parent yet, whoo, get ready. All right? And you're just like, what do I do? I'm throwing this away. I'm just throwing it away. There's no saving it. Um, and, so, and so we got to this. We, we got to that point. You know, like, uh, poor Oakley, like, he had made a mess in his underwear, and uh, someday, someday, he'll probably cringe uh, I'm telling the story. He made a mess in his underwear, and we, um, like, you know, in the moment, you're just like, oh, I'm frustrated, because this is worse than pee. Like, this is so messy. <laughs> um, and so, Oakley, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Like, what happened? You know, probably a little bit more emotion. uh, Like, why did you do this? (laughs) I don't want to clean this up. And he says this, and I know he's three and a half, but from the mouth of babes, right? Like, uh, he said this, Daddy, I was scared. I was scared. And, um, And it hit me for a second. It's like, he was scared to ask for help. Like, he didn't know how to ask for help because, number one, like, for him and individually, like, he doesn't like sitting on the potty. I don't know. I don't, that's just one of the things he struggled with. But I think, I think for us to take all of that mess and apply it to our life, which sometimes can get messy, right, when we get stuck and we're scared to ask for help, that's, that's the thing that, gets a, that holds us back the most, God is your heavenly father. No matter your experience with any other kind of father figure in your life, God as your heavenly father is a good father. And all we need to do is come to him and ask for his help. You don't have to worry about him getting frustrated with you. Like, I am, I am not God. I was, I was, I'm way wrong a lot of times in how I, like, figure things out as I go. I'm just a kid that grew up and had kids, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, that happens. But God, in all of his wisdom and understanding, he knows. He knows you are not perfect. You're gonna walk through things in life that are perplexing to you. And all we need to do in the moments that we feel bogged down, locked in, like just bound up, 
held back. All we have to do is ask him for help. All we have to do is ask for help. The first step is just admitting that we need God. Admitting that we need God. Everybody say, admit you need God. The second step is this. How do we find freedom from insecurity? Is believe God is enough. Believe that God is enough. Um, Remember, I, I gave you a snapshot of Moses up to, the certain, up to this certain point in his life. And uh, then I, I went back to the Hebrew people and how they, all they had to do was call out, right? Well, at this point in time, while well, the Hebrew people are back in Egypt and they're calling out for God to help them and they're crying out because uh, the Hebrews are just being terrible to them, like causing them to do more and more and more work treating them more poorly and more poorly. Like all that while Moses is in the wilderness and he's shepherding sheep. And one of the most iconic stories of Moses's life is set to occur. In, in Exodus, Exodus chapter three, verse 15, um, I'm gonna, I feel like I get a pass a little bit because I'm gonna go to my notes now from, okay. Um, and if you don't feel that way, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm, I'm making excuses for myself. I'm sorry, that's pitiful. All right. Um, Moses chapter three, Moses chapter, Exodus chapter three. I'm just the youth pastor, right? I'm just making up books of the Bible. Oh, man. Exodus chapter, th- chapter three, verse four. Um, right before that happens, Moses is just minding his flock He's passing by probably, scholars would say, a spot where his flock, um, you know, eats grass and is, is, you know, hanging out. Probably a spot where they've done that so often. And Moses is just like, it's just another place. I've been here a thousand times, right? Scholars would say that he's probably been past there a thousand times and he just didn't notice it before. But at that moment, he takes time and he slows down and he sees something he had never taken time to see before, a burning bush. Um, The language, the language, the original language that's used there is kind of alludes to the fact that maybe the bush had been burning all along, just Moses didn't slow down enough to take time to notice it. Now, that's a whole different message in and of itself, right? What would happen if we slowed down enough to like notice the things that God is doing in our life? Maybe we would look at life a little bit differently. I think maybe we would be less insecure because we knew that God is working no matter where we're at or the level of, you know, like the level of goodness that we're at. God is always working regardless of all of that. But Exodus chapter, four, chapter three, verse four, right after Moses realizes that this bush is burning, um, verse four says this, When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard all of this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress. Call back to chapter two, right? He had heard his, the cries of his people. I had heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious, spacious land. It is a land that is flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pez, all of the ites um, now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses says this in verse 11. Who am I to appear before, Egypt, before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. One more verse. 
or two more verses. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent, sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? Now get this, this I love this. This is so awesome. <clears throat> God replied to Moses, I am who I am. I am has sent me to you. Now, I want to I wanna just take a second. That I read all of that to kind of hang out here for just a moment. When we take that first step and say, yeah, I admit that I need God, and then when we take this next step, believe God is enough, like sometimes we're in a spot where Moses was. God's saying, Moses, I'm sending you. And maybe it's not so much that God's saying, I'm sending you. I think that he does send us, but that's another message for a different day. But I think right here, what we need to hear from this is this phrase, I am who I am. Essentially what God is just saying, he's saying, everything, I am everything that not just you need, but I am everything that, that those people need. And if you just tell I am is who, is who sent you, they'll, they'll know. They'll know. Listen, you're going through things in your life, and you're like, I know, I admit that I need God, but sometimes we still try to hang on to things. We, we, we hang on to things, and we try to make it, like, take control of the situation, and we try to work through our own power. But can I tell you that the more you try to do that, the, more, the harder you're going to wrestle, and God's just there. I have freedom for you. All you need to understand is I am is here. I am is here. And if you would just let me have, if you would let I am have what you're going through, man, I can do so much more than what you could ever do. If we would understand that God is enough, we would be able to find freedom from insecurity, from fill in the blank, any kind of thing that we're walking through. If we would truly understand that God is enough, he is all that you need. He's all that you need. He's all that you need. The third and the final way that we can find freedom from insecurity is this, um, if we just surrender to God. And I know I kind of gave a little bit of foreshadow to that. If we surrender to God, there's a really cliche phrase uh, that I think probably, um, <laughs> I don't know, people, people use this all the time on social media. Uh, they say, let go and let God, right? Like you've probably seen so many t-shirts. You've seen so many posts, hashtags, like Pastor Craig talked last week about it, hashtag like blessed, all right? Uh, like blessed, let go, hashtag blessed, <laughs> hashtag blessed, hashtag let go, let God, right? Um, but sometimes I find that these cliches, they are used over and over and over again because really, honestly, uh, maybe it's important for us to understand. Sometimes we, we take hold of our situations and we're like, you know what, like I can handle this. I, I, I know, like I know that I need God. I know that like he is enough, but, um, but sometimes, sometimes our actions don't line up with um, our thoughts in that moment. We don't act like, we don't act like we understand that um, God is enough. We don't act like we've actually admitted that we need him. And because we don't act like that, then we really have a hard time surrendering, surrendering to God the things that only if we would just let go of them, he would take care of it in a way that's way better than what we could ever take care of it. Um, in Exodus chapter four, we're gonna skip ahead to chapter four, verse one, Moses is still at the burning bush and he's having this conversation with God and he's like, He's debating. He's rebutted God several times at this point now. Like, hey, this is why you don't want me. Like, uh, you know, and I just, I, I'm not a good candidate for this. Um, you know, later on, he actually tells God, like, I, I can't speak well. Like, I speak with a stutter. And so, um, like, I can't, I can't do that. And God's like, no problem. I got somebody that's going to go with you. And Moses is like, oh, every time, you know, because God is enough. God is enough. And so there was, there's, this, there's this action, though, that happens in this conversation that I want to just pull from real quick at the end before we, before we start to close. There's this action that Moses, that God asks Moses to take. Um, and it's in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. I'm just going to read, uh, I'm going to read several, several verses along. 
But Moses protested again. What if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground. Throw it down on the ground. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back like I would too. Can I get an amen, right? (laughs) Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. And I'm like, oh no, (laughs) I'm not doing that, right? He said, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it. And it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Now, for some of us in the room, our insecurity weighs so heavy on us. It holds us back from opportunities that maybe the Lord presents us with. It keeps us from leading our family the way that the Lord's called us to lead our family. It's, it's, it keeps us from loving our kids the way that the Lord's called us to loving our kids. It keeps us from interacting with people in a way that God has called all of us to interact with people. There are things that are insecurity if we don't deal with it, if we don't hand it over and surrender it, it'll keep us from walking in those opportunities that God calls us to walk in. And it's interesting what God said to Moses. He said, hey, see that staff? What's in your hand? Moses says, it's just a staff. It's just a staff. A couple of years ago, maybe it was a couple of years ago, I don't know, time flies, and I'm getting older, so time flies, goes, it, it goes faster, right? Um, a while back, Pastor Craig went through a, a message series, and he used a staff as an illustration, right? And we talked about what the staff was used for in that. Anybody remember Babs? Anybody remember Babs? I just, she's still backstage, guys, right? <laughs> Somebody let her out to pasture, right? <laughs> um, no. I just saw it this morning before we baptized in the first service. Um, and what a shepherd would take their staff, they would use it to correct. They would use it to reel in. They would use it to redirect, right? They would use their staff in order to do their job. And um, any shepherd knew how important their staff was. It isn't just a staff. It's an important thing. And God, looked, God told Moses in that moment, I know the bush, like it was burning, and God was like, like, like God looked at Moses in that moment, and he said, hey, give me what is super important to you to hold on to. A lot of us, man, we don't want people to know about our insecurities. A lot of us, we try to hold, hold back our weaknesses to people. We try to, like, keep that under wraps. It's super important for some of us, we keep the reputation that we have. We want to manage that reputation. We want to keep it under control. We don't want, to, we don't want people to know the things that, that really get us down and, 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 and we struggle with. We don't want people to know that. And just like Moses was holding on to that staff, we sometimes hold on to this thing called insecurity. And we don't want to give it up. But the thing that that we keep holding on to, that God's just asking and asking and asking and asking us to give up to him, could be the same thing that he's going to use to lead your family out of the wilderness. Could be the same thing that he's going to use to lead you into an opportunity that he has for you to walk in. Could be the same thing that he's going to use you to lead people that you're surrounded by at the workplace, at your school, wherever you might find yourself, maybe the grocery store, to the Jesus that has a life-saving, changing, eternal life-giving message that they need to hear. But the question is, if what's in your hand is so, like, why don't we just give it up to him? He can do so much more with what we have in our hand than what we'll ever be able to do on our own. Um, illustration, just to kind of bring this to life as the worship team comes to the platform. How many of you, um, I would say, how many of you have ever given your kid a paintbrush? And uh, some of you are like, no, I'm I'm wiser than that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah. Ever give your kid a paintbrush and 
uh, and then tell them to, to paint something. It's one of the funnest things you could ever do as a parent. Um, maybe, maybe also an adventure. But like you give them a paintbrush and have you ever done this where you're like, okay, here's this really famous painting. I want you to paint it, right? Well, here on the screen uh, is, is a, a painting or re, um, if, if you're like, is that one of his kids? No, it's not. <laughs> I can tell you it's not. But a kid did draw this, right? And it was one of those situations where it's like, hey, um, take this picture and I want you to recreate it on a piece of paper, right? And so all of these people are hanging out. They're, uh, it looks like they're having a meal uh, of eyeballs and um, they, some of them like red and some of them like yellow. I think those are Purdue and IU fans. Um, see, the Lord brings the enemy together. Like, it, he brings us together. He's the Lord of unity. Um, and, and so, like, some of them have mustache. One has a beard. That's great. Um, and so, like, that's the recreation of a picture in the, in the eyes of a child, right? Go to the next picture. This is what it was supposed to be, Right? Like, were you getting there on your own? Some of you, I don't believe you. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know, like, we all meet and we talk about different, like, messages coming up and stuff. And I knew that this illustration would be in this message, but I didn't know what picture was going to be used. So when I saw the first picture, first service, I was like, what in the world is that? It does look like, I, they're all eating eyeballs. Like, that's not, why are you showing that picture, Pastor Craig? Um, but instead, this is, this, is what, this is what the picture is that that kid, that artist, was trying to recreate. Um, I, think, I think when we try to run our life, um, we end up with the kid's painting. Can you throw that back up real quick? This is our life when we try to run it. This is our life when we try to run it. When we hold on to the staff. When we think that we can do better than what God can. But what God has for us, next picture, is this. I, I don't know about you, but if I know that God can create this out of my life, Lord, take the paintbrush, right? Take the paintbrush. Because I'm, I'm tired of falling flat on my face. I'm tired of messing it up. I'm tired of relying only on my strengths, only on, uh, on my giftings. But God, I know that you have something bigger and better. You have something that you want to do with my life that looks less like a mess and more like a masterpiece. And I can't get there on my own. I have to have you. And so I surrender. I surrender whatever I have in my hand. Remember the first part of that. The Lord said, what do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? Matthew, Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 10. He says, he says this, he says, if you cling to your life, you'll lose it. If you keep holding on, if you keep just trying to run your life under your strength, under your power, you're just going to lose it. It's going to end up looking like the kid trying to make the last supper. But if you give your life, if you let your life go for my sake, you'll save it. Meaning if you'll just hand over the paintbrush, if you'll give me what's in your hand, I will take it and I'll use it and it'll make an impact on the world that you live in. And it, and it won't be for your glory. It'll be for mine. Because I can do more with what you have to offer than what you could ever dream of doing with what you have to offer on your own. That's, that's what happens when we surrender the staff, when we surrender to God. He does more with what we have than what we could ever do on our own. Let's bow our heads. I don't know, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know the things that um, you're walking through. I don't know the things that you're holding on to. You know, we talk about insecurity this morning, but honestly, each one of these things, admitting that you need God, believing that God is enough, and then surrendering to God, you, you can apply those 
If you're not dealing with insecurity, you can apply them to the things that you are dealing with. Because each one of us, and we walk through things wildly different, depending on who we are, the stories that we live out, the situations that we face. And this morning, as we kind of take a minute and we reflect on what we've heard and how the Holy Spirit's spoken to us, just kind of symbolically, as we have our eyes closed, I want you to just kind of put your hands out in front of you. Just put them out in front of you for a second. Just between you and the Lord, I want you to think about what is it that I am holding on? What am I holding on to? What are the things that if I would just surrender, my life would look vastly different? If I would just let go of complacency, if I would just let go of insecurity, if I would just let go of control, if I would let go of whatever it might be, what are the things that you're holding on to? That if you would just give it to God, if you would admit that you need him, if you would understand that he's enough and then take that next step and you would just surrender to him. What? could he do with your life? How could he use you to reach those around you? How could he use you to change the world that you live in? Now we're going to take a next step. And if you would say you're in this room and you would say, I know that there are things that I hold on to And really it has a lot to do with the fact that I'm insecure, that I don't trust God to take care of it, that I don't really have, I haven't really admitted that I need him. If you would say, that's you, that I have something that I'm holding on to, just be bold enough to raise your hand. In a moment, we're gonna all pray together. We're gonna pray about this. You raise your hand, like I'm holding on to something that if I know that I would just let go of it, if I would just let go of it and give it to God, that he could change my life, that it would be better for me. If that's you, would you be bold enough to raise your hand throughout this room? Heavenly Father, God, as we have this this moment of realization, as you've spoken to us, I ask that you would just continue to reveal the thing in our life that we're holding on to, that you're just asking for control of that you're asking for us to let go of and to give it to you. And that it wouldn't be something that at the end of our time together this morning that we would, uh, that, that we would lay down and then, then out of a moment of just like knowing what I've always done, like pick it back up and take it out of here with us, but that we would just lay it down at your feet, leave it here with you so that you can work on it, so that you can work in and through us. God, we know that you can do more with our mess than what we could do with it ever. So God, we just lay it down. We give it to you. We said you would take it and fix it in our life. We thank you for that. Maybe those of you who are in the room, maybe your first thing that you need to lay down is just control of your life. And it's not so much just a singular thing. It's, it's just like all together. You've lived your life your way, but maybe you've, you've sat here and maybe the Lord spoke to your heart. And maybe you're, you have a realization right now that your next step is that you just need to give your life to the Lord. That when we first started talking this morning and we talked about how where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And wherever you go, like that means that there's freedom that goes with you because the Lord's spirit lives inside of you. You're like, man, that's not me because I've not made the Lord of my life yet. Well, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Like this is your moment right here. This is your moment. 
So when you find yourself bound up, you find yourself held back, you find yourself held down and afraid and insecure and dealing with depression and anxiety, you know deep down inside that the Lord's spirit lives inside of you and there's freedom to be found where his spirit is. And you're just at a point where you're like, no more. I'm gonna choose to live, give my life to the Lord and live my life for him. And if that's you today, and you'd like to make that commitment and make Jesus the Lord of your life, would you be so bold to lift your hand up just so I know who to pray for? I see that hand. Anybody else? Just for a couple more moments, I see that hand and that one. That's awesome. Anybody else? I see that one too. That's awesome. You can put it right back down. Church, we're gonna pray and like we do, we're gonna pray together so that nobody prays alone and maybe the person next to you is bold enough to pray along as well. We're gonna pray together. Let's pray. You can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, from this point to now, I have lived my life for me. But God, I know that there is freedom for me to experience when I give my life to you. So from this point on, the best that I know how, I'm choosing to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate that? It's awesome. Let's stand to our feet, church. In just a moment, the worship team's gonna come and we're gonna sing one more song uh, together. Prayer partners, I'd invite you to come down to the front right now. You might be in this room and you would say, hey, that's pretty awesome that I put words to that, but maybe you know yourself better than anybody else. Maybe you need to put an action step to it where you're, you get out of your seat and you come down and you're like, hey, I know I can't do this on my own. I need, I need, I need some prayer this morning. If I'm gonna really give up what I'm holding on to, I need some prayer. And so these prayer partners are down here to pray for you, whatever it might be, that or anything else. I'd invite you to come down to the front and, uh, and they have made themselves available to you to pray for you. The other thing that I want you to do after we have a moment of worship, so I want, like during this moment of worship, don't just let it be another thing that we do on a Sunday morning. God can move in this moment just like he moved during the other worship set earlier. Come on. I'm gonna say it again because it was good and you didn't get it. All right, God can move in this moment right here just like he did in the moment that we had before baptisms, right? During baptisms, right? And so as we worship the Lord, man, maybe this is just your moment from your seat. God, I surrender to you. I surrender the things that I hold on to, that I try to keep control of. I surrender to you my insecurities, my thoughts that aren't, aren't your thoughts. I surrender to you all the things that I know if I would just lay them down at your feet, that you would make my life not a mess, but a masterpiece. This is your moment right here to do that symbolically, even from your seat if you need to do it there. So as we worship afterwards, you're gonna walk through those doors at the end and we have paintbrushes for you all. They say Exodus 4-2, and it's just the question, it's just the question that God presented Moses. What is in your hands? And it's a reminder, it's a reminder every time you look at it, God's asking you what's in your hand that you're holding on to, that if you gave to me, that if you gave to me, I could use it and I'd blow your socks off if you would just give it to me and how I can work and move through you. Come on, let's just begin to worship, come on. <laughs> 